about how good God is. And um, it motivates me to tell other people. You know, I saw, uh, I had somebody sent me a Facebook this week. Says, hey, remember that place we went and ate down in New Orleans? Uh, what was the name of that? I got some friends that wanted to go, and they were asking me what the best place was, and I wanted to tell them. And, you know, when we have someplace good to eat, we don't mind telling everybody. I mean, we just, oh, yeah, you got to go down here. It's great. And can I just tell you, a buddy of mine used to say this all the time. I hadn't said it in a long time. But our barbecue here, right here, is pretty good. I, you know what? Our, our pizza here is pretty good. Well, I almost spit my gum out. It was so good. And I'm just going to tell you that what we got with Jesus is awesome. Why are we so hesitant? Why are we so afraid? Why are we so scared of telling people about, <laughs> about the barbecue <laughs> that we have at Lakeview Baptist Church? Does anybody follow me at all? Can I just tell you that what you have right here is greater than what the world can give you? So I'm in the second week of what I'm calling the God question. So let's take a look at a quick video. Mark, do we have that? Okay, let's see it. Imagine, if you will, if there was a video playing that had wonderful music <laughs> along with it, and it would have been so great. Somebody hum a tune while... Okay, well, let's just bring the lights back up and we'll try again. There we go. Okay, so we're in this, uh, if you remember last week, I talked about you're asking the wrong question. Remember that? And uh, we talked about ideas like uh, the, the question is not if God is real. The question is really, do you believe him? Well, I'm going to kind of go through that same vein this week. And so our, our, our first one that we'll talk about this morning is, and it's kind of long, so if you're taking notes, I'll say it a couple times here. But the question is not, the question is not, why would a person believe the Bible's account of creation? The question's not, why would a person believe the Bible's account of creation? Got it? The question is, why would a person believe in evolution at all? Why would a person believe in evolution at all? In Proverbs chapter 15, verse 14, the Bible says, The discerning heart seeks knowledge, but the mouth of a fool feeds on folly. And I'm going to talk a lot in these first two points. There won't be a lot of spiritual content in here because I'm going to tell you that the, that the world cares nothing about what you have in the Holy Bible. It does not. But I can tell you this, as Christian people, as followers of God, as children of God, we need to understand the difference between evolution and creation. And, we, and, and listen, if we don't know we're putting ourselves as a, at a disadvantage because there are people all around us that will quote Scripture and they'll say, see, it contradicts one another. See, it doesn't make sense. See, see, see. But it's because they don't know Scripture. They can take a little piece here or a little piece there, not know the whole content of it. And guys, I'm going to tell you what, we're going to learn some content about Scripture. We're going to learn it this morning. So you hang with me. Uh, I usually use a lot of Scripture uh, so you won't see a lot in, in points one and two, but boy, point three, I'm telling you, so you get ready for it. Here it comes. So let me tell you something. As, as a Christian, um, we don't have to be afraid that science will contradict what we believe in the Bible. We're going to look at that. A, a, a scientist um, who is a Christian, and there are many, there are many, will arrive at exactly the same data using scientific methods as an atheist will. Science does not depend upon a particular belief system and is uh, therefore not the sole domain of, um, of evolutionists. Evolutionists are going to tell you a lot of things and they're going to they're put a bunch of letters after their name that makes you believe that what they're saying is true. And the fact is, they know nothing more about, about what is real than the people did in Christopher Columbus's day that said the world, that the world is flat and if you go too far, you're going to fall off the end of it. It, it, makes, it doesn't make any sense at all, nor does evolution. So let, let's look at some things here. So I'm here to tell you this morning that that, um, uh, that the attempt to start an, a, a debate uh, between an evolutionist and a creationist is kind of like 
uh, science versus religion or, or, or fact versus faith. It's completely erroneous. And I don't want you to believe that just because I said it. Uh, and and I mean, I, what I would do, first of all, is I would look at a bunch of facts and, and, and figures that I see in the Bible. And I would go, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this. But let me tell you this. When you go outside of the kingdom of faith, people don't, they don't care what the Bible says. Most people in the United States right now don't even have a Bible. You go outside the Bible belt, and it won't just be collecting dust. It'll be non-existent. You go in, I was talking with, uh, with Andy Brown a few weeks ago, and he was saying that most people in Seattle don't even know what a Bible is, much less whether or not they own it. So, um, so I, listen, I'm not the smart. <laughs> you'll say amen. I'm not the smartest guy on the block. I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. Um, uh, Cheryl said amen real loud. But the idea that life appeared spontaneously from a pile of goo is a problem to me. It's a problem. And, 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 and I believe that, that it's an insurmountable problem for, for um, uh, evolutionists. I'm going to see why in just a minute. Um, but, but let me tell you this. Life and the creation of life clearly, um, uh, um, in, it, it was clearly the truths that are written in Genesis chapter 1 are true. And you're seeing paleontologists, people that create, uh, that, that dig in the ground for different things, they're seeing it more and more and more that what they say in the Word of God is being true, uh, uh, tested and proven again and again. So the, the reason that that plant life and animal life and human life look so organized is because they are. Uh, and, and, the, and such a design required a designer, and that designer is God. God didn't just create a cell and then um, let everything happen in motion, and, and then it brewed for a couple million years, and then something happened. In fact, that is, there's a term for that. That's called theistic revolution. Theistic mean theory, mean, mean, mean theology, means God happened, creation, and all that. For years, you know, I was kind of wondering if maybe that was kind of the truth. Maybe there's a difference between, maybe, maybe day one happened and it was a couple of million years, and then day two and it may be a couple of million years, and this evolution created and, and, and the, 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 the writer of, uh, of Genesis just kind of condensed it down. Don't think so. Don't think so at all. Don't think so at all. I, I just, I'll just tell you, I have been... I've been in, you know, if you ever created a sermon out of the internet, it was today, I'll just tell you, because I have been so many uh, sites, Christian sites and non-Christian sites that, that was talking about creation and evolution and all those things. But listen, don't get sucked into the idea of theistic evolution. It's false. Um, instead, God created every living thing, just as the Bible said in the first Two chapters of, a, of, of, of Genesis and everything else is ridiculousness, and we'll look at why. Even Charles Darwin, Darwin the, the engineer of the theory of evolution, wrote this. Listen to this. In his book, The Origin of, Spe of Species, when he, when he thought about the miracle of the eye. I mean, he's thinking about this whole process of evolution, so you think about the eye, and it says this in his says, and quote, I suppose that the eye, in all of its immutable convariances, um, for adjusting the focus, for uh, um, different uh, distances, for emitting different amounts of light, and for the correction of spherical and chromatic obliteration. That's why I don't understand all that stuff. But uh, could have been formed by natural selection. Seems, if all of that seems, he said, I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree. Let me just, let me just write, break that down for you in, in Cave Springs and Wooster language. Charles Darwin decided a theory, we're going to later on, a doctrine about evolution that's, that, that life formed from a, a single cell and then it just kept you know, changing and changing and getting better and getting better and all of this. And, and then it changed into eventually the fact that a human body, in fact, eyeballs and all the different things of eyeballs and all the different things of the heart and all the different things, and we'll look later on, on DNA, that just happened by chance. You don't have to be real smart to understand that that's just nonsense. Um, so that, the end quote on that, but um, and <laughs> speaking of, speaking of, B, of uh, DNA, DNA uh, has, not, has been not, not been really knew about or discovered until a, 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 not all that many years ago. But let me tell you about DNA. 
Every human cell has trillions, trillions with a T, of them. And everyone has a six-foot-long strand that gives information stored up into it. And every one of those stored-up parts of DNA has as much as a set of a Cyclopedia Britannica. And so it explains how the the cells build into proteins. And I don't have to, listen, I don't understand electricity either, but when I go into it and I think about it, I think how good God is. But when you look at something like this, and, and, the, bar, and the article says this, um, in, in uh, uh, um, um, I forget which, which one it is, I'm drawing a blank here. Um, but anyway, the article said, for this information to be random would be like taking every letter of the encyclopedia, breaking them all apart, throwing them into a box, and throwing it on the floor, and all the pieces fall into place exactly the way the encyclopedia is supposed to look. I mean, you start thinking about things like this, just ridiculous. So the question is not, why do we believe uh, evolution? The question is, why would anybody uh, believe it? Secondly, the question is not, did God create life? The question is not, did, we, did, did God create life? The question is, why don't we believe it? Um, so uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, the man without God does not accept the things that come from God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are discerned spiritually. So in, instead of um, spiritual discerning wisdom, we've been brainwashed by the world. I'll say that again because I thought you heard that. Instead of spiritual discernment, we have been brainwashed into believing an ill-conceived lie. Let me just throw some things at you right quick. It's kind of disconnected, but let me just throw a few things to you. Richard T. Clark and James D. Bales wrote a book entitled Why Scientists Believe in Evolution. It contains numerous letters written by Charles Darwin, Thomas Huxley, and other early evolutionists. And it pointed out that these, things, uh, that these things men indicated in their letters by their own admission was because of their hostility toward God and their bias toward the supernatural, they jumped at the doctrine of evolution. Let me just tell you what that means. They hated God so bad, they so disbelieved God that they jumped at foolishness instead of that. And it's exactly what 1 Corinthians 2, 14 says. The, in, in the in the absence of something that makes sense, they grabbed at something that totally made nonsense instead of something that made sense. Because if you look at it, God is the only answer. Thomas Huxley once said, it's clear that, 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 that the doctrine of evolution is directly antagonistic to that of creation. Evolution, if consistently accepted, makes it impossible to believe the Bible. I mean, look at it. Uh, he, he didn't call evolution a theory. He didn't call it a, even a fact. He called it a doctrine. Uh, d uh, d Slow down. Dictionary.com described the word doctrine as a particular principle, position, or policy taught by advocating as a religion or a government. Now, what does that mean? It means... <laughs> The bottom line of this really means, and there was just study after study after study after study from uh, both um, uh, atheist and antagonistic people and people that don't care, all the way to Christian people that said that you cannot, um, you cannot factually come up with the with with the idea that evolution is true, and you don't if you but if you don't have anything else, you'll grab at something, and at the end of the day, it takes a whole lot more to to believe in evolution. It takes a whole lot more faith to believe in evolution than it is in creationism. <laughs> and if you want to know why biblical creation is not taught in the public schools or in uh, several private schools and in Catholic schools, I'll tell you, I think. Um, Sir Arthur, Arthur Keith, a British evolutionist, can tell you why. Uh, he said evolution is unproved and unprovable. We believe it only because the alternative, which is biblical creation, is unthinkable. Whew. I don't know whether y'all like that or not. This sounds like a book report to me, 
But I just want to tell you, I, I, I mean, I probably spent 20 hours this week just looking at quotes and only gave you the top of the little, the, the, where just the top comes in. Um, the, the, the evidence, what's this? I just thought this was funny. I, the evidence for evolution is so non-existent that a guy named Fred Hoyle, who's an atheist, and a lady named Chandra Wixani, maybe not close, but she's a Buddhist. Huh. Here's what they wrote in an article called Evolution from Space. It's supposed that life must have flown here from outer space. How far out do you have to go, folks? I mean, evolution made zero sense to this atheist and this Buddhist, and so they decided that because of that, it probably came from um, people from Mars or somewhere. Makes no sense. But, but, here's the other side, but. Listen to this quote from the book, Seven Years to the Origin of Life, printed by Cambridge University uh, Press. It said, quote, um, spiritual uh, excuse me, scripture, scripture never tries to explain God or prove that there is a God. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 simply states, in the beginning, God. It simply begins with the assumption that there is a creator and his name is God. The lie of evolution is totally the opposite. It simply begins on the assumption that there is no God, end quote. And there are thousands of articles from universities that um, around the world with quotes like that. Uh, let's listen to a few of them here. Professor Louis, uh, Louis Moore, a vocal evolutionist, wrote this. He said, the more we study paleontology, which is the fossil records, the more, we, the more certain we become that evolution is based on, watch this, faith alone. That's a professor of paleontology, a smart and learned man that said, I believe in evolution, but I can't tell you why. I believe in evolution, but there is no factual basis for it. Uh, Dr. Lu, um, 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 Luton... Um, Thomasian, you can tell I'm not making these up, um, a physiologist for the Atomic Energy Commission said this, um, scientists who go about teaching that evolution is uh, a fact of life are the great con men. And the story that they are telling may be the greatest hoax ever. In fact, evolution, we do not have one iota of faith. Sir Am, uh, Ambrose uh, Fleming, uh, uh, electrical engineer and physicist, some of the smartest men in the world. The evolution theory is purely the product of the imagination. Smart people, scientists. You think you'll ever hear that at CNBC? You think you'll ever hear that at CBS News? You think you'll ever hear that in, in all of the things in TV, uh, you know, short of, 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 of the uh, uh, Christian uh, broadcast areas? Swedish embryologist Dr. Soren Lovetrup said, I believe that one day the Darwinian myth will be ranked the greatest deception in the history of science. When this happens, many people will pose the question, how did this happen? She went on and began to talk about the scientists of old and several of the different things that we know now are completely false, things like the, the, the Earth, according to scientists in the past, thought that, the, that, that uh, Earth was the center of the universe. And not only is Earth the center of the universe, the sun's not uh, either, at least it is in this one, but it's not the center of the galaxies and all those different things. Some of you guys are smarter than me. I could sit down and just let you go on and on and on about the idea of what the world has done uh, to hoodwink you, to, to brainwash you and all of those different things. But not only do we have that, not only are we brainwashed, but listen, I can tell you what, we are also in a spiritual battle with the enemy, Satan. And Satan will tell you things that are a lie and they look so good that, that people will, will, will do them thinking that it's right when they're completely wrong. Look at the book of Genesis with, um, um, uh, with Adam and Eve when Jesus says, comes in and says, look, look, you, you can take of any uh, 
tree of the garden, but, but this one of the tree of fruit and of good of knowledge, you can't, can't do that. And then Satan comes along and he says, well, did you, you know, God really say that? And he starts hoodwinking you and starts um, brainwashing you. And then all of a sudden you understand what happens is you do something that you shouldn't have done and then you pay for it because of that. But we're in a battle with Satan. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 and 13 says this. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual uh, forces of evil and dark in the heavenly realm. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. So that when the day of evil comes, and it will come, you may be able to stand your ground, and after that, after you've done that, after you've done everything to stand. Does anybody agree with that? Here's the problem. I'm going to take a left turn just for a second. I'll come right back. Um, as Christians, 30, 40, 50 years ago, everybody assumed that God was real. They may not have chose to follow him, but they knew he was real. Back 30, 40 years ago, Everybody assumed that the Word of God was real. They may not have adhered to it. They may not have cared about it, but they believed it was real. But let me tell you what's happened in the time since 60s, 70s, 80s, and 2019. We have stopped believing not only in God, but if there is a God. We've stopped believing in the Word of God or even if there was a word from God. We've stopped learning God and learning his will and learning his ways. In fact, we've got to the point to where we don't care about them. And that comes from, that comes from pastors all the way down to whatever church member that you see. You say, well, I believe in God and I study the word of God. Can I ask you this? Has it affected you? Has it changed the way you act and feel and, inter and interact with people? I mean, I, gosh, I tell you, I just got back. I, I guess one of the reasons I'm so pumped up today, went to an evangelism conference first couple of days of this week, and I just heard pray, uh, 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 sermon after sermon after sermon after sermon talking about that we've got to fall deeply back in love with God to the point to where it affect, affects us from the heels of our feet to the top of our head. We've got to, first of all, before we go out and win the lost, we got to come inside and we got to relearn how to praise God. We got to relearn how to worship. We got to relearn how to study God's word. We got to relearn how to apply God's word in the daily walk. We got to relearn to depend on prayer. And if we don't, and if we don't, we'll find ourselves closing the doors of churches all over America and all over the world. It's already happening. I mean, ever since the first man rebelled against God, men have been in this state of rebellion that basically says, God, we don't need you, and we will do things our own way. Evolution aids in that. By saying that, by, by understanding that it's a system of thought, it's really a, 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 pr, a religion of itself that gives man the reason and the permission to reject God. Because if God, um, if, if we can convince people that God didn't create man and that God wasn't God, an eternal God, all things goes along with that, if we can do that, then also morality goes out the door. And when morality goes out of the door and God pulls away from us and leaves us to our own devices, we will destroy ourselves. We'll do it. We'll, I mean, look in, look, in, look in Europe. Look in all the different places that, that, have, that used to was very influenced by Judeo-Christian belief systems that now don't believe them at all, and they went to hell in a handbasket. I'm about to burn up. Um, another quote, Michael Denton, an Australian molecular biologist and physician, and at one time an outspoken evolutionist and atheist, he agreed with that. He said, Darwinism 
broke man's link with God and, con and um, consequently set him adrift in the cosmos without purpose. It's interesting that, that, that this same man, Michael Denton, when, um, when, when evolution, I mean, excuse me, when the DNA uh, was discovered and all of that, he completely recanted that statement and became, I don't know if it didn't say, the article didn't say if he was a Christian, but he, st but he started believing in intelligent design because it was so far outside the realms of what he could believe in that evolution could do DNA that he said, that's ridiculous. And he became an advocate for intelligent design. I could go on, but you get the point. So here's the, here's the third point. We've got, um, we've got the first two. Here's the third point. The question is not, Guys, we need to get this. Because if we don't, we'll just be arguing about whether God's real or God's not real and all those different things. We can look back and we can look back and we look back. The question is not. The question is not, where did you come from? The question really should be you thinking, where are you going to go? Where are you going? It's not where you've been. It's where you're going. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. I, I wonder if maybe it would be to the benefit of our enemy, Satan, to get us into a debate about evolution versus creationism. We need to know about it. We need to be able to answer it. But I can tell you this, guys, if Satan can get us toned out over here by talking about things that really don't matter over here. Now, Pastor, it does matter. It does matter. Whether God's real or not, it does matter. Get that. I get that. I do get that. I do. And I'm motivated by that. And I'm, I want to win every single person to Christ. But, guys, if you don't have... If you don't have the ability, if you don't think about where you're going to shift your focus, talk about that. Talk about evolution versus, versus uh, uh, creationism and all that. But if you don't find a way to migrate from the past to the future, you're wasting your time and Satan's got you right where he wants you. If, if, you, if there's not a point where that you can, you can uh, migrate that argument from over here to you advocating that somebody loves you, know, loves you deeply and wants to save your soul. If you can't make that transaction, then you're just kind of got your feet stuck in the mud and Satan's got you just where he wants you. Ever thought about that? I mean, um, has being a child of God changed your life? Has it altered who you are? Have you become a new creation? Let me tell you some things about uh, people I, I thought about this, when I thought about this migration between talking about these things in Genesis to talking about these things in John 3, 16 and Romans 10, 9 and all these different things, I thought about Joshua. At the end of the book of, of Joshua, and Joshua was this guy that was so close, he took over when Moses um, uh, was called home to be with God, he took over and he's the one that in the first couple of chapters there that, that, that God said, I'll never leave you and forsake you, stand strong, know my word, all those different things that you need to know. At the end of his life, here's what he wrote. He said in, in uh, chapter 24, verse 14, he said, now, now, now that you've done all these things, fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshiped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Then he goes into a list. Now, as I begin thinking about these lists, I think, gosh, those lists are still here today. See if you can connect the dots as I read them. It says, choose for yourself this day who you'll serve, whether... The gods of your forefather served beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose you, land you are now living. But for me and my family and my household, we will serve the Lord. Joshua and his family chose the Lord. Now, how does that how does that connect between Joshua chapter twenty four and Lakeview Baptist Church? I, I'll tell you. Today, we would migrate that, we would translate that 
verse. Um, if if um, serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you'll serve. Whether the gods that you serve before you knew Christ as your Savior or the gods of this world today, choose yourself, but for me and my family, for me and my house, I am going to serve the Lord. I'm going to serve him. I'm going to learn his precepts. I'm going to learn his word. I'm going to learn how to live my life after his word. I'm going to learn, to, I'm going to teach my kids about these things. And when they come home and they tell me stuff, and I, I'm interested in their life, and they start telling me stuff about evolution, you know what, you need to study that, and you need to take a test on that, and then you need to forget that foolishness because it ain't real. Let me tell you what the real stuff is. Let me break God's word open and tell you what really happened at the beginning of the earth, who really created life, who really loves you, and who wants to have a life with you. Tell them that. Go, listen, you're the only place they're going to get it unless they get it here or unless they get it at home. We better be ready. We better put the whole armor of God on. In, um, in, uh, in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, verse 5, Paul challenged this by advocating that we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets ourselves up against the knowledge of God. And we, watch this, we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Guys, I'm going to tell you what. I'm, I'm, Y'all need to hear me on this. You think about this, you'll find this is true. It scares me to death to think about allowing our kids to figure out for themselves if God was real or God's not real. It scares me to death to think about just letting them go into a world and letting that world teach them about the beginning of time, how we were created, and what God is in their life. It scares me to death. Why? Because Satan is stronger than every single one of them short of Christ. You're sending your people out to total destruction unless you teach them. Does anybody agree with that? Guys, I'm going to tell you, I'm preaching to the choir. I get it. But I want to tell you something else. I want to tell you something else. I want to tell you something here. We're, we're a lot like um, what, what the Gospel of John chapter 20 talked about, verse 27. Jesus said to Thomas, who was one of the apostles, who was one of the main church guys, who was one of his chosen ones to walk beside him, when Jesus came back from the dead, Paul said, I won't believe it unless I touch him, unless I put my hand in his side. Jesus came into the room where they were and said, put your finger here and touch my hand. Reason, reach out your hand, put it in my side. And then he said, stop believing, stop doubting, stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God, then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. At what we react and say, well, that's good. Because I've never seen God. I've never seen God. I've never put my hand in his side. What do you want from me? I want you to read Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Where it says, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. Can I just tell you that I have touched God? Can I just tell you that I have felt God? Can I just tell you this morning that I have reached out at the time when God, when I needed God the most, and he has grabbed hold of my arm. He has grabbed hold of my head. And sometimes he has grabbed hold of the nap of my neck. And he changed me from what I was to what I am now. And I will tell you from this pulpit that I've touched God and he's touched me. Listen, I, I, I want to be transparent with you this morning. And I want to tell you that I struggle with the same stuff that you struggle with. Um, I, I thought a lot about the... Uh, the man who brought his son to Jesus to, to be healed. And, and Jesus said to this guy in, Ma in Mark chapter 9, verse 23, he said, everything's possible for him who believes. I mean, the Bible says that. Verse 24, immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my disbelief. Satan 
there is this spiritual warfare going on in your life every minute of your life. From the moment you get saved until the moment that you go on to live in glory, Satan tries his best to nail you down. Aren't you glad that we have God? Aren't you glad that we have his word? Aren't you glad that we have songs of praise? Aren't you glad that we have sermons and, and scripture that we can look at that says, help my unbelief? One last passage. My goodness, y'all getting out early. Y'all can go ahead and call ahead and make your reservations for lunch. And the Gospel of John chapter 4, verse 23 says this. Jesus said this. Yet a time is coming and has now come <laughs> when the true worshipers of Christ will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. I'm going to do my best Robert Smith impersonation right now. <laughs> For there is a kind of worshiper that the Father seeks. God is spirit. And his worshipers must worship. In spirit and in truth. I'll tell you what that means. <laughs> I'll tell you what that means. It's where faith and fact marry one another. James chapter 2, verse 10. Can I just tell you who Robert Smith is? Robert Smith's, Smith's an African American pastor. He's a head of the preaching department at Beam at um, uh, 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 Beeman University, uh, somewhere up north, and uh, he was there at that at that conference, and uh, I, I heard him speak, and God spoke through him into my life. And when we were through there, we went into a preaching a session for preachers, and he was talking about some things. And this guy is so far up the food chain that most people don't see him. He's just ivory tower, just glass room up there at the top. When we're done, I go down. I said, I said, Doctor Smith, would you mind if I have a a picture with you. I'd like to put that in my room. You just touched my heart this morning. And you know what that man did? That doctor, Dr. Robert Smith, with a list, of, a list of letters after his name that would choke somebody, said, come here and give me a hug, young man. I especially liked him because he called me young. <laughs> of course, everybody knows I look young. Uh, I thought to myself, I thought to myself, this guy loves people more than he loves education. He loves people more than he loves being right. or right. He loves people so much because God has done so much in him that it showed through in what he did. Listen, if we just store up all, these, all this knowledge and we store up all this information and we store up all these things in our life and we never let it come back out, Sounding symbols and, I don't know what the Bible called it, gongs. James chapter 2, verse 18 says, But someone will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. God never intended for us to sit on the sideline and just learn about God. True worshipers of Christ will be the hands and feet of God in a lost and dying world. Book report followed by a sermon. Did either one of them touch your life? I hope so. I, I, I hope that, first of all, you'll fall deeply in love with the Word of God, the very breath of God that will flow into you and flow back out of you. And if we do that, Christian people, if we do that, followers of Christ, then when Christ told us to go out into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world, it will not be hard for us because we'll do it every time we're out. We'll do it whether we're in here or whether we're out there, whether we're out there or we're somewhere else, whether we're somewhere else or whether we're at the uttermost parts of the world, we'll be doing it automatically because the love of our God is more powerful than any other thing that we have.
He'll make a difference through us. Now, I, I don't know what God has done for you this morning with this eclectic bunch of information. But I do know that the Word of God is more powerful than any two-edged sword. So I just pray this morning, if God's spoken to you about something, that you'd make your way to the altar. If you don't, do, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, meet me at the back door. If you don't feel comfortable with that, call me on the phone. My, my number's on the very back of the bulletin. You can call me there night, people do. I got one lady in our church that texts me about four to six times every day, every day, every day. And that's okay because I love her. And when she says I need some prayer over something, now she's, I gotta be honest, she, pre, she texts me a bunch of silly stuff too. But I just love that somebody loves me that much that they want to share their life with me. And I pray because I understand that it's not this old preacher that does this. It's the love of God that flows through us. And let's go out to a lost and dying world and let's show people the love of Christ. If God said something in your heart, if God said something to you, why don't you make it down to this altar right now to be an encouragement to somebody else? How about it? Let's go. Let's stand. Let's pray right now as the praise team's about to sing. If there's somebody that you need to, uh, something you need to talk to God about, you make your way to this altar even during this prayer. Father, we give this time to you in the precious name of Jesus. We know, Lord, that you're there beside us, Lord. I pray that we would push the world aside, Lord, and only believe what you tell us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You come.